Welcome to the deep dive. Today we're tackling a really big one. Uh, for decades, humanity's faced this monumental challenge, trying to develop an HIV vaccine. It's been, well, quite a journey. Decades of intense research, so many trials, and frankly, a lot of dead ends along the way. That's putting it mildly. I mean, the HIV virus itself is just incredibly complex and, you know, crafty. It seems almost designed to dodge our immune system. That inherent nature has made it such a formidable opponent for anyone trying to develop a vaccine. It's a real challenge. Absolutely. But there's some genuinely hopeful news we're getting into today. We're looking at two recent studies. These were reported back on July 30th, 2025, that seem to offer, well, what people are calling a possible new path forward. And what's really interesting is that they're using messenger RNA technology, mRNA. So our mission today is to unpack this. What is this new approach and why might it be such a big step? And just so you know where we're pulling this from, our sources are excerpts from Stat News, specifically their piece, in long quest for HIV vaccine, two studies offer possible new path. Okay, so let's start with the core problem. Why has HIV been so incredibly difficult to vaccinate against? Well, for a long time, the issue was how the virus kind of distracts the immune system. Yeah, distracts is a good way to put it. Think of it like this, Mary. There's a specific part of a key protein complex. It pokes out from HIV's surface, and historically, that part has just misdirected the immune system. It draws attention away from where the real fight needs to happen. Mm -hmm. And that misdirection is incredibly problematic. It basically stops the body from creating the right kind of antibodies, you know, the ones that are actually needed to block the virus from getting into cells effectively. It's fascinating, really, how the virus's own structure became its best defense against our immune system's attempts to uh, neutralize it. So the immune system was responding, but just focusing on the wrong thing? Pretty much. It would generate antibodies, sure, but they'd latch onto these, let's call them decoy parts of the virus that wouldn't stop the infection. Or maybe they'd only work against one very specific strain. So all that immune effort was essentially wasted energy, leaving the body vulnerable. We needed antibodies that could hit the critical spots, the conserved regions across many different HIV strains. Those are the broadly neutralizing antibodies, and those were proving really, really hard to elicit. Okay, so that was the roadblock. How did these new mRNA studies manage to get around that? This is where it gets really interesting, this idea of concealment. Exactly. It's quite an ingenious solution, actually. The researchers designed an mRNA vaccine specifically to hide that distracting region of the surface protein we were just talking about. So think of it like putting a disguise on that misleading part. The mRNA tells the body's cells to produce a version of the HIV protein, but one that's folded differently so that distracting bit isn't visible anymore. Ah, uh, so the immune system just doesn't see the decoy anymore. Precisely. It prevents the immune system from getting sidetracked. Instead, its focus is directed squarely onto the more critical, uh, vulnerable parts of the virus. And that allows it to produce those broadly neutralizing antibodies we need, the ones that can block infection. And the mRNA platform itself helps here. Oh, definitely. mRNA technology allows for this really precise engineering. You're not dealing with the whole virus, just the instructions. So researchers could design those instructions very specifically to make this modified protein, the one with the hidden decoy region. It's faster and more precise than many older methods. And the results seem to back this up quite dramatically. The study showed a stark contrast, didn't they? Yeah, so when that distracting part was exposed, kind of like in older vaccine attempts, only about 4% of participants actually produced antibodies that could block infection. Just 4%. Which is not great, consistent with past challenges. Right, but then, crucially, when that region wasn't visible thanks to the vaccine design, that number jumped massively. We're talking 80% of participants producing those protective antibodies. 80%. 80%. Yep. And this wasn't just in people. They saw the same jump in studies with monkeys, too, which is really important for validating this before larger human trials. And if we just step back and look at the bigger picture, achieving an 80% rate of generating these broadly neutralizing antibodies, that's huge. It's a game changer. For decades, the struggle was just getting any significant amount of the right kind of antibodies. Previous attempts, like you said, might get maybe 10%, 20% if they were lucky, and often not broadly neutralizing ones. So this is a completely different level of response. Absolutely. Yeah. It moves the needle from a, you know, scattered and often ineffective response to something highly targeted, potent, and reliable across most participants in the study. It doesn't mean we have a vaccine yet, but it overcomes one of the absolute biggest hurdles. It represents, well, a significant advance. Okay, so we have this breakthrough in eliciting the right immune response. 
what happens next? What are the next steps for actually developing these vaccine candidates? Right, that's the key question. These are phase one trials, mainly focused on safety and checking if the immune response looks promising, which it clearly does. The next logical step is phase two trials. Which involve more people. Exactly, larger groups. You're still looking closely at safety, trying to figure out the best dosage, but you also start to get a clearer picture. Do these antibodies actually translate into preventing infection out in the real world? It's a bridge to the really large trials. And then phase three, presumably. That's the big one. Phase three involves thousands of volunteers, often in places or groups where HIV risk is higher, to definitively see if the vaccine works as it prevent infection compared to a placebo. And alongside the trials, scientists are also looking at things like, how broad are these antibodies? Do they cover enough different HIV strains? And how long does the protection last? Durability is key. It's definitely still a marathon. Makes sense. Now let's talk safety. You mentioned phase one looks at safety. What did they find? Well, the reports say these experimental mRNA vaccines were generally found to be safe and well tolerated. That's obviously good news. Yes, overall the safety profile looked good, but there was one specific thing that popped up hives. About 6.5% of the study participants developed them. Hives, okay. Yeah, and what's interesting, perhaps telling, is that this wasn't unique to this one study. Another separate trial of an mRNA-based HIV vaccine also saw cases of hives. So it might be linked to this specific type of mRNA approach for HIV. It seems possible. It suggests it might be a pattern, perhaps a mild but noticeable side effect associated with this platform targeting HIV, not just a one-off finding. But you said mild. Were they serious? Apparently not too serious. The reports mention that these cases of hives got better when people took antihistamine, so they were manageable. Right, manageable is key here. But still, 6.5%. Even if mild, does that raise flags for a vaccine that might eventually be given to millions of people? It's definitely something scientists are taking seriously and actively looking into. You're right, even a mild side effect needs careful consideration for widespread use. It raises that crucial question of balancing efficacy, which looks great here, with minimizing any potential side effects, however small. So what are they doing about it? Well, they're trying to figure out why it's happening. Is it the mRNA itself? Yeah. Is it the lipid nanoparticle? bubble that delivers the mRNA? Is it something about the specific HIV protein being made? Or maybe individual immune factors? The goal is to understand the mechanism so they can potentially tweak the vaccine design, maybe change the delivery system, or adjust the dose to reduce or even eliminate this side effect in future versions. It shows that commitment to refinement, you know, yeah. getting past the initial wow to the nitty gritty details. So let's try and sum this up as we wrap up this deep dive. What's the big takeaway here for the long, long search for an HIV vaccine? It really feels like the core insight is about being smarter in how we guide the immune system, right? Mm -hmm. By cleverly hiding that distracting part of the virus, we let the immune system focus on what actually matters for protection. I think that's exactly it. It's a shift from just showing the immune system a piece of the virus to showing it the right piece mm -hmm. in the right way. Concealing the decoy allows for that truly protective, targeted response we've been chasing for so long. It feels less like brute force and more like strategic intervention. Precisely. And while, yes, the quest absolutely continues more trials, more refinement needed, this research genuinely offers a concrete, possible new path. It's a very hopeful development in one of the most notoriously difficult areas of vaccine science. It really highlights the power of, well, clever, targeted science. Finding that ingenious workaround to guide the immune system properly, rather than letting the virus dictate the terms of engagement, it's a real testament to the researchers' persistence and innovative thinking. So here's something to think about as we finish. How might this principle, this idea of strategically hiding or redirecting the immune system's focus, be applied elsewhere? Could this approach unlock ways to tackle other really complex viruses, maybe even diseases we currently think are untouchable? Could it pave the way for breakthroughs we haven't even imagined yet? Thank you.